Two elements of the UK government's Rwanda policy came into focus this week. Firstly, the, the treaty which it concluded with the government of Rwanda. And secondly, its safety of Rwanda asylum and immigration bill. So what does the Rwanda policy involve? It involves removing certain asylum seekers from the UK to Rwanda. This is not a holding measure whereby asylum seekers wait in Rwanda for their claims to be processed by the UK government. Rather, these asylum seekers are transferred into the Rwandan uh, system and their claims are considered by the Rwandan authorities. Successful claimants would therefore stay in Rwanda. They would not return to the UK. In this video, I'll explain four key questions. Firstly, why was the bill enacted? Secondly, how does it seek to overcome the Supreme Court's recent judgment on this matter? Thirdly, is there any scope for domestic legal challenges to the bill? And finally, where does international law fit into this picture? So why was the bill enacted? Recently, the UK Supreme Court found that the Rwanda policy was unlawful because of the risk that Rwanda would further remove asylum seekers to countries where they would face a risk to life or freedom or a risk of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. Although the Rwandan government had offered assurances that these things would not happen, the Supreme Court did not find those assurances to be sufficient. That risk of removal to further countries where those possibilities might arise would breach a core principle reflected in international law, including in treaties such as the European Convention on Human Rights and the Refugee Convention, both of which the UK is a party to. The UK government is bound to respect these obligations as a matter of domestic law. For example, its international obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights are translated into national law by the Human Rights Act. It's unlawful under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act for ministers to act incompatibly with European Convention rights. The UK Supreme Court didn't say that removing asylum seekers from the UK to a third country is inherently unlawful, but it did conclude it would be unlawful to remove asylum seekers at present to Rwanda because the Rwandan assurances about the treatment of asylum seekers were found by the court not to be sufficiently reliable. It followed that removing asylum seekers in those circumstances would be contrary to Section 6 of the Human Rights Act because it would place the UK in breach of its obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. The Supreme Court's judgment was therefore an obstacle which the bill now seeks to overcome. How does the bill seek to do that? In one sense, the bill is very simple. The UK Supreme Court judgment turned on a factual question about whether Rwanda could be trusted not to remove asylum seekers to countries where they would face relevant risks. The government insisted that Rwanda was safe. The Supreme Court disagreed. In normal circumstances, that would be the end of the matter. However, Clause 2 of the bill addresses the judgment by saying that every decision maker must conclusively treat Rwanda as a safe country. Importantly, safe country means that Rwanda is to be deemed to be a country that would not deport asylum seekers to other countries where they would face unacceptable risks. And meanwhile, decision makers for this purpose includes the courts. So clause two, on the one hand, says that courts have got to deem Rwanda to be safe. And on the other hand, it also bans the courts from reviewing government decisions on the ground that Rwanda is unsafe. This is therefore a belt and braces exercise. The question of safety cannot be considered by the courts, but even if it was, the courts would have to treat Rwanda as being a safe country, even if the evidence was overwhelmingly to the contrary. 
Is this open to domestic legal challenge? Well, the UK Parliament is sovereign. And if this bill becomes an act of Parliament, it will, at least as a matter of orthodox constitutional law, be immune from legal challenge. All laws which Parliament makes are legally valid. That's the essence of the idea of parliamentary sovereignty. But there are still some possibilities for legal challenges to be brought, notwithstanding the bill. Firstly, Clause 4 explicitly leaves the door open for challenges on individual grounds. If individual asylum seekers can bring to the court compelling evidence relating to their particular and specific circumstances. But Clause 4 does not allow challenges on the general ground that Rwanda is an unsafe country or might remove asylum seekers to a further unsafe country. Secondly, although the bill disapplies certain parts of the Human Rights Act in this context, it does not disapply Section 4. Section 4 of the Human Rights Act allows courts to issue a declaration of incompatibility if a domestic court finds that an Act of Parliament or a provision in an Act of Parliament is incompatible with one or more of the Convention rights. It will therefore be possible for the bill to be challenged on the ground of incompatibility with the European Convention and for a court in the UK to issue a declaration under Section 4 of the Human Rights Act. Significantly, however, a declaration of incompatibility in recognition of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty does not affect the validity or effect of the act that has been declared incompatible. So while a Section 4 remedy might be issued, it would not actually make any legal difference. Thirdly, it may be argued that the bill is in some sense unconstitutional. After all, it removes a fundamental question from the court's jurisdiction and therefore raises questions about the compatibility of the bill with constitutional principles such as the separation of powers and the rule of law. Normally, of course, the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty would be a complete answer to an objection such as this, because whatever parliament enacts is the law. However, in some cases, certain judges have questioned this. For example, in the Privacy International uh, case in the Supreme Court, Lord Carnworth said that it was ultimately for courts, not the legislature, not parliament, to determine the limit set by the rule of law to exclude judicial review of government decisions. It's always been thought that this is ultimately a hypothetical question. The question now arises whether the bill might transform this issue about the limits of any of parliamentary sovereignty from a hypothetical into a live issue. It's far more likely that courts would seek to interpret the bill where feasible compatibly with relevant constitutional norms. But in dicta such as Lord Carnworth's in Privacy International, the possibility is at least hinted at that a court could consider going further. Finally, what about international law? Whatever the effect of the bill domestically, it cannot change the UK's international obligations, including under the European Convention on Human Rights, and the Refugee Convention. It would be open to the UK to resile from those conventions, to, to leave those uh, systems of international law, but the government has indicated so far that it doesn't propose to do that. The UK Supreme Court has already said that the Rwanda policy is inconsistent with those international obligations. And that will remain so, notwithstanding the deeming clause in the bill that says that Rwanda is to be conclusively presumed to be a safe country. The fact will remain, unless the circumstances change in Rwanda, that it is not a safe country, at least uh, according to the process that the Supreme Court concluded recently. It's therefore very likely that as well as being challenged domestically by way of a declaration of incompatibility, the matter will be challenged before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. 
Indeed, the bill appears to anticipate precisely this possibility. Clause 5 gives UK ministers the domestic legal authority to ignore interim measures issued by the European Court of Human Rights. But once again, this will not change matters on the international level. The UK, in spite of Clause 5 of the bill, will remain subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court and subject to its obligations set down in the Convention. So where does this leave us? In my view, the bill is revealed to be both parochial and hypocritical. Parochial because it conflates the domestic doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which says that as a matter of domestic law, the UK Parliament can make any law it wishes, with the position of the UK as a sovereign state in international law. As a sovereign state, the UK co can contract binding international obligations by entering into treaty arrangements, and it has done so by becoming a party to conventions like the European Convention and the Refugee Convention. Domestic legislation, however sovereign Parliament might be in domestic terms, offers no escape route from those international obligations. The only escape route lies on the international plane by renegotiating or leaving the relevant treaties. As well as being parochial, the bill is hypocritical because the policy, the Rwanda policy, relies on Rwanda honoring its international law obligations uh, by uh, doing what the treaty with the UK says and by not deporting asylum seekers to unsafe third countries, while at the same time, the bill signals the UK's willingness to breach its own obligations in international law. Ultimately, therefore, the bill reduces to a smoke and mirrors exercise that promises something which is a matter of legal fact. It simply cannot deliver.